like how do you follow that up? Mic on oh. for Todd on the lab. Mic on for me, guys. Yeah, you got it. Okay, great. I just want to start by dispelling a rumor, Blake. Is there any truth to the fact that you were, in fact, the original inspiration for the GoDaddy logo long before you even joined the company? <laughs> uh, no. 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 No, but it's funny, though. So, uh, I, uh, so Bob Parsons is the founder, and I spent uh, about nine and a half hours with Bob uh, before deciding I, I was going to come to the company. And Bob uh, says to me, and he's a very, he's kind of a ribald guy, and he goes, he looks at me, he goes, you know, holy crap, I never realized it. You look exactly like our logo. <laughs> <laughs> and so when, when, uh, when, so when I went to be CEO. Yeah, well, yeah, it was like it was meant to be. It, in a lot it was of funny. Ways. So I just, I goofed around with a badge when I got to the company. And this is actually my picture in the company directory, the, the picture that's on the badge. And, uh, you know, it's been, it's, it's a place that has been culturally quite different where you just, you know, the CEO is the CEO and it was pretty formal. So uh, all the IT guys, you know, like scrambled to figure out who hacked my picture <laughs> and they were frightened and they, they said, have you seen your picture? And I go, what, what yeah, why? And he goes, well, it looks like the GoDaddy guy. And I go, no, I did it. You did it. I did it, yeah. It's like, it's, like not, it's not that big a deal. Like, okay, well, this is, this is going to be different then. Yeah, exactly. That's great. So, yeah. All right, well, I should mention, we came so close to breaking some national news this morning. I don't know if you remember, John asked Bill Gurley whether, when Twitter was going to file for its IPO. Just about an hour ago, Twitter tweeted that it has filed for its IPO. Why didn't Bill break the news with us? That's yeah. what I want to know. He so should have broken the news right as, here on GeekWire. As soon as it happened, John ran out into the lobby. Somehow Bill had disappeared. But the I did. I tried to track him down. I didn't see him out there. Taylor has the scoop on GeekWire, so uh, check that out on your computers if you can get online. And so I bring that up because I don't want to miss the opportunity to break another piece of news, Blake. The Wall Street Journal recently listed you on its short list of external candidates to succeed Microsoft CEO <laughs> Steve Ballmer. So Blake Irving, uh, do you have an announcement for us here today? Yes, I do. <laughs> Tw I Twitter so. just filed for IPO. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, no. Is that something you would ever consider? I, I, got, a, I got a good chuckle out of it. Uh, and I mean, I, I literally guffawed and uh, showed my family and they were like, that's pretty funny, Dad. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. What, what do you think uh, Microsoft needs to do next? I want to jump into GoDaddy right away, but wh where, where should Microsoft go as long as we're on that topic? So I had, I had the microphone away from my, uh, my mouth when I said it. I said, oh, my God. <laughs> um, you know, who knows? I mean, it, 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 St Steve has, you know, I think that it's easy to malign Steve, uh, and I think that, you know, there's been a fair amount of that. Uh, he's got a tough job, man. It's a giant company. Right, and he had some decisions to make, whether he splits the company up, whether he keeps it together, does he let businesses run more autonomously, does he you know, become the, the, the hub and a spoken hub model and become the group program manager of the company. You know, he, he had a lot of different decisions to make and, and he decided to do it one particular way. And there's lots of other ways that he could have done it. Who knows if any of them could or could not work or would change some of the trajectory that the company's on. You know, the guy's done an amazing job returning um, earnings, you have an affected stock price, which I think is more, more a factor of the hope coefficient than anything else. Um, but you know, man, who, who, anybody can second guess. It's very, very easy to do it. Um, but to actually get a company of that size on a trajectory that changes dramatically, um, you know, the, the, the positive uh, slope of that company is going to be uh, pr pretty difficult. And I would hate to say that I had an answer for you that was going to do it. <laughs> so if it's not you, then who? Who's, who's, who's on the short list in your well, mind? Well, I heard you were on the short list. <laughs> really? That's a mistake. <laughs> no, I, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, there was a bunch of guys named, and I, you know, the thing that struck me was they just acquired Nokia. Elop was on the list. They just acquired them. Yeah. So uh, you know, potentially that, that is something that could be uh, interesting as well. But you know, yeah. there, there, there are a lot of really great guys out there. Yeah. And, and I'm telling you, that's a tough, tough job. You know, and all the, all the guys that I have a tremendous amount of respect for, whether it's Kevin Johnson or Paul Moretz or Steven, um, you know, they're, they're, all, they're all, you know, guys that could, could, to, could do the job. Yeah. Uh, it's a tough gig. So how about your job? Tell us about GoDaddy. Why did you want to go lead GoDaddy? Well, it's, it, it's interesting because I've been a customer of GoDaddy's for a, a long, long time. I, I actually, when I started uh, at the company, I had 49 domains under management. And when I went and introduced myself to the company, I introduced myself in an all-hands meeting about a month before I started, 
and said, okay, you should know, you need to know some things about me. I know you guys have all been up on my LinkedIn profile because I had like 2,000 hits this morning. So I don't need to give you any of that crap. So let me just tell you, I'm customer number, and I gave him my customer number. I told him what my lifetime spend was with GoDaddy and said, so I have some observations about your company. You know, just from a guy on the street. Now, I haven't been in the inner working, so I don't know. But uh, the thing that was interesting to me, and it's, it's really why I joined, unbelievable marketing. Right? Well, you can disagree or you can agree with the marketing tactics they've used for the last seven years or so. Um, you know, since the first Super Bowl ad in 2005. Um, but very good at marketing and actually wonderful at metrics. Very, very good at actually dialing in and knowing what their acquisition cost is, et cetera. And one of the best customer support organizations uh, on the planet in technology with an NPS score of 70, which for those of you who have support organizations and you're a technology company, if you're positive, you're pretty happy. To have a net, a net promoter score of 70 is nuts. But I'd interacted with the product a whole lot and knew that this wasn't a company that was a product company. And it was actually, as you go through and you use the website, you could find, you could actually see the company silos with every transaction you did, the website building or the front of site, or you go to the control panel or you try to do something else. It just, it, there was a lot, lots there that could be improved. And they, they had done absolutely remarkably at how quickly they moved uh, for a company that's not even based in the Valley or based in Seattle or in a technological hub and have done, had done a ton. So I thought, well, you know, I'm not a great marketing guy and I'm not, certainly not a customer support guy, but I'm a product guy. And this might be a really interesting mix for me. And the, the other thing that was very interesting was the company's culture um, is edgy, uh, it's fun, they love to get shit done, they love to put their shoulders into things and work hard and work in a mosh pit and you know, that's the kind of person I am. So the, the cultural attributes that sit above the table that we all like to talk about when we talk about our companies were a perfect fit for me. So you have come in and you've really set about to transform this company. I want to show you something on the screen that might be a little bit painful. Tell me about this, this homepage. It's beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a lot going on there. Um, <laughs> yeah. Can, 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 can I just comment on people's photographs for a while? <laughs> no? Okay. So, look, this is, this, is, uh, this, this is a company that is actually, if you think about a transaction-based company, they're trying to create, you know, transactions. Uh, there's a lot going on here. It definitely looks like a, you know, a retail store. Uh, you know, there's so many things to click on. You know, how could you go wrong? Uh, <laughs> so, you know, the, and actually, strangely enough, we actually use this, this uh, photograph a lot, this old picture of the website, when we contrast where we are today. Um, and I suspect, I'm hoping that might be where your next one is. Uh, it's a lot simpler, it's flat, it's a flat UI. You're going to see this change and, and evolve over the course of the next, you know, next few years, uh, frankly, and, and more importantly is what's going on on mobile. Uh, but but it's, it's just simpler, it, more, more importantly than the home page, and this is a hell of a lot more simple, um, is just the path of checking out. Uh, my, my comment used to be that, you know, in the old days, back when that, that first advert, uh, the first homepage you showed, I, I felt like I was, uh, I was dodging offers on my way to try to check out, and it was like, boy, if I can get out of the, the shopping cart with the only, only the thing that I bought, uh, that's a success. Uh, and so we're actually, we smoothed that, made it really, really easy, uh, have been very, very comfortable saying, look, w we just want you to get what you want, get out, and have an experience that, that gets you onto using the product that you bought that you intended to buy. Uh, and, and we've made some big significant changes in that regard and we've seen a customer growth that's actually running 10% over what we thought we were going to do because we did it. Because people go, God, this is easy, I can just buy something. And the domains industry generally has followed a pattern of buy this thing, buy something else, buy something else. And it's like people just want to have an identity. Yeah. Right, so. You alluded to this earlier, but GoDaddy built a huge amount of market share through uh, tactics that were, you know, frankly, offensive to a large portion of the population. Um, what do you say to the, the, the company's critics about GoDaddy's marketing strategy and the way that it built its business? Well, you know, so uh, it's, it, it, I think most people feel the way that you feel. And I think as, an, as a guy who was using the product, you know, and, and had watched the advertisements, it, it's hard not to make the same observation. Um, Bob Parsons, who's the founder of the company, um, when he decided, you know, I'm going to go into the Super Bowl, and he actually, 
The guy had done very, very well with Parsons Technology, if you remember, Intuit buying that, and was basically a financial package. And then, then Bob actually, when the market was crashing in 2001, uh, 2000 era, started actually buying bigger ads. He says, you know, and his company, because he started doing bigger ads, started taking off. So he had a pretty, pretty large amount of profitability and had the ability to go buy the biggest ad segment he possibly could, which was, uh, of course, the Super Bowl. The Super Bowl, exactly. So he says, I'm going to do a Super Bowl ad. Let me think about that because I know I, I, nobody knows what a domain is. It's not interesting. You can't sit there and chat somebody up about the domain business because it's a commodity business. Nobody knows what the hell you're talking about. Unless you're at the GeekWire Summit. Unless you're at the GeekWire <laughs> Summit. <laughs> so he says, uh, you know, what do I know about the Super Bowl? Well, most, most people are watching are the guys, and most of them are drunk by halftime. So what, what am I going to do? And he came up with that first advertisement that was, that was so controversial and, and it's strange enough, the story is, you won't believe this, this is absolute fact, that those two, he, he bought two ad spots, about a million bucks a piece back then. Now they run about six, just you know, between, you know, it, was eight, it was eight years. Um, he bought one at halftime, a million bucks, and then he bought another one later in the show for a little less money, but they had an open spot, so they sold it to him. And he said, you know, I'm, uh, I'll buy the second one. He ran the first ad, and he actually had to get it approved by the network. The network approved it. He ran it. They had so many negative calls on it, they said they wouldn't run the second one. Right? Mr. Parsons, we know, we're not running the second one. We know you bought it. We're going to credit you full price on the first one, so we'll just give that one away to you. You don't have to pay for that. Two Super Bowl ads for free. Within four weeks, he had gained 20% share in the domains industry. <laughs> Right. So when you're trying to get attention, uh, and I'll say, you know, Bob Parsons is a brilliant marketer, knows his audience, knows it well, gained 20 points, and he was off to the races. And it's so like, you know, lather, rinse, and repeat. And so we just kept doing that thing. Now, it turns out, once you have 65%, you know, share in the U.S., you don't have to get attention anymore, and 50% worldwide share. You don't have to get it anymore in domains. In fact, when you're saying, look, we're not about domains anymore. We're actually about enabling and empowering small businesses around the world and helping the little guy become successful, and nobody cares about the little guy, you actually have to change your game completely. It's not just a rebranding. Well, it is a rebranding in that it's not just the look. It is, in fact, a complete change in the business in a lot of ways. And women are, in fact, huge owners of small businesses. So 58% of small business in the United States are owned by women. So, what? Oh, yeah. So, oh, yeah. So come January or February or whenever they're pushing the Super Bowl back to this year, yeah. what will the ads be like? Uh, they'll be more consistent with uh, the, the ad campaign that we just ran. So we, we actually have a new vision for the company, which is about empowering small, small business. It's, it's actually changing the global economy, you know, radically shifting the global economy in favor of small business by enabling people to confidently start, easily run, and grow their venture, whatever it happens to be. That, that's it. And so we're going down the path of talking about them, talking about the little guy, figuring out how to help them, letting them know that we have people that want to talk to them, want to help them solve their problems. And our ads are going to be around that. They're still going to be edgy. They're still going to be funny. Uh, they're going to be memorable as hell. Um, but they are not going to feature the things that we've had in the past that have polarized and offended. Now, I'll say last, anybody remember the last Super Bowl ad? Bar Raffaelli and uh, Jesse Heyman? doing a uh, lip lock for 30 seconds. Yeah. How did, could you forget that? Did anybody remember what GoDaddy did at the end of that ad? 1.7 billion impressions in the first two weeks. Yeah, crazy. What does this say about society? I mean, come on. It says, it says that everybody here is going, that stuff's horrible. We're going, I got to see that again. I got to see. <laughs> I love this. We're having a running theme here today, which is apparently you shouldn't be paying for marketing at all. <laughs> if you go back to Bob Parsons' example in the first Super Bowl ad that they well, ran. Well, it's crazy. I mean, think of how powerful the yeah. marketing that he did was. Uh, you know, and I think that uh, we'll continue to make those investments. You know, we have a pretty good sized marketing budget. We do some of it on TV. Yeah. We do a lot of SEO, SEM. We're certainly not, as was described earlier today, uh, you know, we're not on the crack of SEO and SEM. Our brand has 80% uh, aided brand recognition in the U.S. and 50% unaided. So it's, you know, we've, we've got the power. Now it's what do we do with it? You know, and we want to let people know what we do and who we do it for. So you're in the midst of what we call in the startup world a pivot. 
and you talk about this in, with startups, you know, going, going down the pr product path and having to switch course very quickly. You're kind of doing this, you're not getting out of the old business, but you're really starting to double down and, and move into a new business. I'm just curious how that transition is, is going, how you're leading that, and you know, that involves sometimes the culture shift in the company too, and how, how, are, you, how are you executing on that? Uh, it's, a, it's a good question. So for, for me, when you, when you enter a company or you enter a division that's in, a, in a big company or you're doing a little startup, you have to actually set a vision out there that is, that is different and is bigger than life. So that, that vision of you know, radically shifting the global economy towards small business and, and then having a strategy that's actually a 32-page strategy document that you can share with the board and then a lot of detail behind it and then a very crisp vision that everybody in the company knows what it's about you can actually steer everybody in a, in a very open way towards that thing. And then it's hiring people that know, that, that, that know what to do in places where they didn't have strength before. So I've been doing a ton of hiring of great people. Um, up here, down in the Bay Area, uh, in, in fact, op even open an offices in places where we didn't have presence before to Kirkland build up here the jobs. And Kirkland here in Yeah, Seattle Kirkland, Kirkland uh, in Seattle, and uh, you know, frankly, a lot of the folks in the Bay Area are ex-Seattle uh, uh, folks uh, as well. That, that we've uh, we've been hiring, but you you basically have to shape that vision and then put together clear metrics against what success looks like, and we, we went as uh, far our, our COO who, who joined us from KKR a few months ago, who was the interim CEO for the company, um, we we did a session where we literally had a spreadsheet up on the wall and had every one of the strategy component owners say what you know, they could play with two things they could play with average revenue per user ARPU or they could play with the number of customers they were increasing. And they would come up and say, we think we can do 50% more ARPU per user per year, and we can increase uh, the number of customers by 500,000. And there's 10 different strategy pivots. Each one comes up. They start doing their stuff. And by the time they're done, we have a giant revenue company. And we're about $1.4 uh, in revenue today, um, double-digit growth. That's 2014 or 2013 revenue, that's, annual yeah, revenue, that's roughly? Yeah, roughly around uh, $1.4 billion. About uh, $11 million paying customers, if I remember correctly, or uh, is it higher now? It's about $12 million now. Okay. So with that kind of revenue and those kind of numbers, you know, we just heard the news of Twitter uh, filing to go public. When are, GoDaddy's a private company. When, when, when will we see GoDaddy become a public company? You know, you, 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 never, you never know, right? Uh, like, so it's something that certainly is a possibility for us. Our numbers, our, our outcome... Uh, would be a very good outcome today if we decided we wanted to go. I mean, we're, we're double-digit revenue growth, double-digit uh, EBITDA growth, double-digit customer growth, you know, bi and not like, you know, barely double-digit, I mean, deep into them. So there's good metrics now. But so what's holding you back? Well, because what, what you want to do if you've got a new strategy and a vision that you put in place is you want to put points on the board for each one of those things before you, you make yourself a public company. So international is a giant thing for us. So uh, believe it or not, that 1.4 billion has been done in English pretty much. We have two languages. We have English and we have Spanglish. Um, <laughs> and we're, we're actually going to take it around the globe, do 30 languages, do 60 different markets over the course of the next 18 months. Uh, we want to put points on the board for that. We want to put points on the board for doing, being a better hosting company, for being a better website building company, for having an easier path to the checkout, for doing a better job supporting that little tiny person who's trying to figure out how to make their way. And I want to put points on the board for all that stuff before we, we get into that, uh, get in that position. And then even when we're there, you just hope the market's receptive for it because you know, the, the, the notion that you can actually file confidentially and then everybody says, oh yeah, we're, we filed confidentially. There's a big difference, right? Because you don't have to make your S1 public, right? So you don't have to disclose a bunch of things and if you want to pull that back because market you know, takes a tank, um, you're, you're actually, it's a much more favorable thing for companies like ours that say maybe it's time's right, maybe it's not, and you can be a little more sure-footed uh, without giving away too much information about your company to your competitors. So if the pattern holds, expect GoDaddy's IPO filing about 5.30 today. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, it, it's, today's not, it's not going to be the day. Okay. So you mentioned the Kirkland office. You are not the typical technology company uh, coming into the Seattle market. We see tons of tech companies coming up here. It started with Google back in 2004. Uh, it's continued with many others, Facebook, Twitter. Um, but, but yours is a, a different breed of company. What's the pitch that you make to engineers to join your beautiful offices at Kirkland's Carillon Point? Uh, it's, it's, it's close to the same pitch I was just telling you. Yeah. So, great marketing company enough scale and enough footprint, even around the world, 20% of our business is outside of the country in spite of us not doing it well. Um, 
and it's a company that has done on the product side can do so much better than they've done, and still they're doing a billion. It's a private company for starters, right? Which is like a 1.4 billion dollar revenue private company, with you know over 200 million in EBITDA. That's kind of a pretty interesting company to join in that kind of environment, and. There's so little that we have done that is, I'd say, you know, technologically, the kind of thing that you do either in the Bay Area or in, in Seattle, because it, it was just done differently. And that gives us a ton of lift um, if you hire great engineers. Yeah. So the engineering pitch is like, if you want to change the world for small business, you want to help a company that's got masterful, uh, has been masterful in both marketing and customer care and build the, one of the better product organizations in the world, which we think we can have, Come to GoDaddy and take a company, you know, public, in a way that is going to be fundamentally different, and you can change the world. Yeah. So we focus obviously a lot on the Pacific Northwest technology economy. You're in a unique position because you worked at Microsoft, although you you commuted uh, from California at the time. Yeah. You're now in Scottsdale. You you worked in between and in Sunnyvale for Yahoo, which I want to get to in a second. But you've now sort of revisited the Seattle market to open this new office in Kirkland. What's your opinion of how the Seattle tech market has evolved, for better or worse, in the time yeah. that you've been away? You know, it's, it's uh, I guess it's been six years or so since I was literally here pretty much every day. Um, and, and over those six years of not being here and spending most of my time in California, uh, there, the differences between the, val the, the Bay Area, the Valley, uh, and, and the Seattle area generally are pretty marked to me. Um, I actually like to almost call it, this, is, this tends to be a more opaque uh, or opaque market. So you have Microsoft and you have Amazon, both who do a magnificent job of making sure there's a pretty solid wall around the talent base in both of those companies. Um, and so trying to actually poke through and understand who's there and where the talent exists is, is pretty difficult, right? It's all personal connection and it doesn't actually migrate out. Uh, Amazon and Microsoft being the two largest. And then there's a, 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 quite a few smaller companies and startups, but not nearly the volume that you have down in the Bay. And the way I'd characterize the Bay, and I used to, the way I characterize the Bay is a tr more translucent marketplace where people have their own personal brand. And that personal brand travels with them from small company to small company to maybe a large company for a little while and then back out to a small company. And that network stretches all the way from San Francisco down to San Jose, you know, through Mountain View, Sunnyvale, Palo Alto, Menlo, Woods, all the, all the different neighborhoods that all house pretty magnificent tech companies. And the amount of translucency between these companies is just different than it is up here. Uh, I'd say also that the venture community down there, which is where most of the venture dollars are, the, the, the guys don't, they don't want to fly very far. Just, I'm just saying. Right, so if they're going to invest in companies, they tend to want them to have them in their own backyard. And we heard that from Bill Gurley this morning. Yeah, and it's, it's and it's it, it's true. And you know, Bill Bill took I think it's taken more flyers up in this area than possible. I was on the board of a company that was in Madison, Wisconsin, and they're saying, "Well, what's the first piece of advice that you'd give us?" It's like, "Get the hell out of Madison, Wisconsin." <laughs> You know, well, yeah, you know, well what about you? You're in Scottsdale, Arizona, running GoDaddy. Well, I, mean, I am. Well, yeah, right. Okay. And what's the, what are the first couple of things that I did? I, I've established a, you know, we've established a place in the valley. Uh, we've got 40,000 square feet in Mountain View. We've got 12,000 we're in right now. We just opened another 40,000, uh, right, frankly, in the Microsoft building that's flanked by Google, et cetera, because, you know, that, tra that translucency, that transparency is, is good for us, too. And we opened a place up here. Because frankly, when you, when you need to acquire great engineering talent, and the talent up here is fantastic. It's just hard to find it. Because so, it's impenetrable fortresses like Microsoft or Amazon. And I know a lot of those guys. So putting, putting a, a place here is, just makes it much, much easier for us to attract that talent. What, what would it take to get you to move the headquarters, get the hell out of Scottsdale, move it up to Seattle? Uh, <laughs> it, it would take about 160 days less rain. <laughs> Spoken like a Californian. Well, look, I, I lived up here 10 years. I moved while I was still at Microsoft and did the reverse commute because I was doing a bunch of stuff in the Bay Area office with the Hotmail and, and Ultimate TV and Web TV yeah. and those things. So it was, it was just I reversed my commute. And frankly, uh, you know, the, my, my uh, be better melatonin, better uh, attitude. Vitamin D. Know, yeah, better vitamin D. It was just, you know, that, that fundamental difference between sun actually made a difference uh, for me and a, and a lot for the health of my kids, which yeah. mattered a ton. 
So I don't know, John, if you have got any questions in on the Twitter feed. I haven't been monitoring okay. that closely. Yeah, I know. I, I gave up on my Surface about an hour ago. So <laughs> uh, you're um, the only guy that's ever given up on a Surface. <laughs> So the other company that we just alluded to, I think that was a hiss out there, wasn't it? Uh, that's how you know you're in Seattle. I do. Uh, the other company, of course, that you spent quite a bit of time at, at a, as a senior executive, uh, was Yahoo. Yeah. Uh, what do you think of what Marissa Meyer is doing at the company? Well, I think it, uh, you know, it's, there's, some, there's some greatness there and some not, not so greatness. I do believe that the company desperately needed a, a product person who understood the internet very well to, to succeed. And there was a pivot where the, the company had an opportunity to make that said, I'm going to be a media company or I'm going to be a technology company. Uh, the, the thing that I think that, that Yahoo ought to be is a platform company. You know, if, if they want to be as large as a Facebook, they want to be as large as a Google, which is, you know, I don't know if that's possible. But I think being a platform company for media generally is, is the potential play. So if Marissa, I think, goes down that path and can get the talent back in the company they need to pull that off, I think that there are, uh, there's lots of possibilities. I think hope went up. Um, I'm not sure if that hope went up because you know, everybody's got an iPhone now and food's free or that there's, a, there's, a, there's renewed focus on product and people are actually producing great things. So I, I know lots of people in that company feel a heck of a lot better about it uh, and feel like it's moving in the right direction. So I, I hope Marissa can, can turn it around. It's a great brand. Uh, I know a lot of people there, know the founders well, and I wish, that, I, I wish that they pull it off and can become a, 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 a giant company again. Yeah. So looking ahead, just here to, to, to wrap things up, if you looked out, uh, say, 2015, 2016, if you were starting a startup now and you wanted to hit the tech trend that was going to be most important two, three years out, uh, even if it's you know, applying to your own personal interests, is there, a, is there an area of technology that gets you most excited where you see just the most opportunity, maybe it's for, as some inspiration for some of the entrepreneurs out here in the audience? Uh, you know, it's, so there's, I, I, yeah, I guess. I mean, I love, I, I love consumer technology generally. Um, and when you look at tiny businesses that, you know, our customers are usually one to five people. They're, they're really consumers that are trying to figure out how to turn into uh, a, a real business. Um, th th that, in those two, two marketplaces, there's two very, very obvious things, which is multi-device, where the cloud's the, the king, and they're syncing across all these different things. So mobile and multi-device, and I don't think, I don't think mo pure mobile mobility is the answer. I think when I think of, or, or I'll say mobile phones, because people will say, well, you know, it's all, it's all here because everybody's coming online and the next uh, century is going to be using this primarily more. Cars are mobile, tablets are mobile, P uh, P PCs and tablets, there's going to be a qu quite an interesting conundrum over the next five years about uh, is a what's tablet what? just a P PC, what's what? There's going to be a massive merging of those two things. Um, and then if I think about big data, and we look at big data right now as just this big crunching problem of, boy, there's big data is just about databases and what are you going to do with it? Th that is really the key. And, and big data is it's videos, it's graphics, it's information about customers, it's telemetry on how your site works, how people move, where they are, what they're doing. All of those kind of things will start to form the, the next set of apps. And there, you know, I, I can't say what, what, what's a great app you know, fi fi in 2015 or f five years from now. But if, if I was, you know, Anybody seen that the uh, the intern? Oh sure, the, the, Google, the Google movie. The Google, the Google thing. movie. Yeah. Well, so the, the, I forget who made the the the, uh, the statement about just solving problems with a multi-device mobile platform. That, that is what we're all you know in this room doing right now. I mean, pretty much everybody in here is looking at a mobile device of one kind or another. Not while you're talking, but yeah. oh hell, I should. Other times. No, not for me. <laughs> and 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 you've got giant data up there. Um, anything that solves a real problem across those things using big data that can be incredibly uh, almost like a savant about what you're going to do next uh, or what you ought to do next could be something that's, that's crazy cool. In the internship, or the intern, you know, the guy talked about, uh, you know, I, I just want to know if I'm too drunk to drive a car, which is very much like the Uber problem that was solved, which is like, look, I'm out in San Francisco, I'm partying, and I don't want to drive, so how do I get to a a car easily and be able to go find them and they can find me and I don't have to negotiate with, you know, with my credit card and that stuff because I might lose it or I'm going to whatever. Those kind of real world problems are the things that ought to happen on top of that palette of mobile devices, mobility, and big data. 
And you know, they're, they're not abstract, they, they're not and should not be abstract concepts to people because they're just tools in, in a giant palette that you can solve real problems with. So Blake, one of the challenges that you have coming into the organization here is that you're, you're having to do this, a, a really a new culture here and a rebuilding of, of GoDaddy. There were some problems with uh, PR issues in the past related to the former CEO, related to some hunting issues, as well as some of the, the ads that many saw as sexist. So can you say here today that you've put GoDaddy on a different path that is going beyond that and moving, m moving beyond the past of GoDaddy? Because there are many uh, that, that have a bad taste in their mouth related yeah. to, the, to the company. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's it's a, it, we're we're on a, a deep transformation of the company, right? We're, what what who we serve, uh, how we serve them, how we position ourselves, how our employees feel about themselves, uh, you know, about serving those little guys is is really different. I, I'd encourage you if you can go you go go Google manifesto of kick ass, and there's a very compelling video up there that are of our our employees, basically reading the thing that we call the manifesto of kick-ass. And what we say in the company, our mission is we help small business kick-ass. That's what we try to do. You know, it's, that, that maintains our edginess and it actually allows us to, des to describe what we do. And when you see that video, I'm guaranteeing you, you'll have an emotional response about the seriousness and the passion that people feel for helping these little people that nobody takes care of. Uh, it, it's, uh, it's a quest. It's, it's not a company. It's a, it's a quest we're on. And everybody in the company, I think, one, one thing I'd characterize about the company, everybody's leaning into this thing like, man, I am so in. And, uh, you know, that, that, that is something I, I find amazing. And I haven't found it a whole bunch of other, uh, other companies. That's great. great. Perfect Thanks, note Blake. to conclude on. Everybody, please thank you to uh, Blake Irving, the CEO of GoDaddy. Thanks, Tom. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you, Blake.